What's going on guys, Alex here and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the RSQ3. So I've now had the car for about a month or so, done quite a bit of mileage with it. So I feel like it's time for a little bit of like an honest review, like what I actually feel like the car's like, what, what it's like being the daily that I bought it for, like the workhorse and all that kind of stuff. And just seeing if it really has like lived up to my expectations. So, like I've said, I've had it for about a month or so, done about 1,500, 2,000 miles in it as uh, I do tend to travel a lot for work. And I must say, so far, I've not really got a lot to complain about. The only things that I've got to complain about are like minor things that I really have to try and think of. So yeah, let's just uh, get straight to it. So for those that don't quite know exactly what the RSQ3 is, it is basically what it says on the tin. It is Audi's Q3 model, so they're sort of smaller SUV and it's powered by the 2.5 litre five part RS power plant that you see in cars like the TTRS, the RS3. And uh, yeah, it's exactly sort of the mix that I needed. Well, I say needed, wanted is uh, more correct. And uh, yeah, it's the practicality of the Q3 while still having the performance of the sportier hatchbacks, which I so love. Now, like I mentioned, I do a lot of mileage and with that comes consumption. I've got to say so far, this has really impressed me. So, I tend to do a lot of motorway miles and without any traffic and stuff like that, so maintaining a decent sort of 60, 70 mile an hour average, it was doing 30, 32 MPG, which I, I wasn't expecting at all. I was sort of expecting mid twenties at best. Um, and if you've ever driven around uh, the UK, so especially like the M25, M1, those kind of areas uh, sort of heading up north, I say up north, I'm from down south, so anywhere north of London is the north. Um, yeah, you'll find that there is a lot of like 50 mile an hour speed limits and just the overall traffic congestion and all of that kind of stuff. You can't actually do the normal motorway speed. So your average speed tends to get cut down to like between 40 and 50 for a while. And at that point, it averaged 36 MPG, which again was just shocking for me. So on paper, I think they say it will do like up to 30 MPG, like sort of motorway miles and 20 something in the town. But so far I, I found that it, uh, it does a lot better than that. So that is a massive win in my books. Cause uh, again, I didn't particularly buy this car to be sort of MPG friendly or whatever you want to call it. Like, I bought it knowing that it is what it is. It's a 400 horsepower Audi, so it's going to use petrol. But the fact that it is a little bit more economical than I anticipated is definitely a bonus and works in my favor. And yeah, so from that side of things, that is fantastic. Moving on to the interior, which obviously is where I spend a lot of the time, well, pretty much all the time while driving. This, I've got to admit, is so comfortable and absolutely love it. My two passenger princesses, so my wife and my dog, they also absolutely love it, which is a huge win. So if you've seen my previous video, you, you'll see where I mentioned like the different driving modes and all that, and when it's in comfort, absolutely fantastic. It just doesn't feel like you're driving sort of an Audi RS model until you put your foot down and then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, it actually is something a little bit more special, but it's all just so nice and quiet inside. And you've got all your creature comforts, so like your heated seats, your Apple CarPlay, all of that good stuff. You've got a banging sound system. It could do a bit more bass, but that's just me. I like my bass, like all my other cars have always had uprated sound systems, bigger subs, all of that stuff, but that's just, personal preference um but yeah my only two things that i don't quite like about the car i say that as if 
it's like a deal breaker, is when I'm driving, I like to have like my elbows up. Now, on the door card, driving is about here. The armrest down here is a bit too low for me to sort of like keep my elbow there. And the top of the window is too high. So I know like that it's like minimal things, but it's, again, it's, it's nothing uh, in like the grand scheme of things. The other little annoying thing is this armrest. Now it does sort of lock up in place so you can turn it up and you can slide it forward. So like this is fantastic. That's like perfect elbow resting place for me. But the annoying thing about it is it doesn't really lock, it just slides. So it's not got like a release mechanism to move it back and forth. And whenever I do have a passenger, sometimes they'll lean on this as well. And when they do, if they knock it wrong, it just slides backwards and yeah, it's just annoying to have to pull it back up. But again, very minor things. And yeah, that's really it so far about things that I don't like about the car. One more sort of little annoying nagging thing is um, the, you've got the climate control in the car and that works great. The only problem is there isn't a sync button. So I've always had it on all my cars. You press the sync button, it does both sides, same temperature. You just turn the driver's side um, toggle and it'll automatically move it up, down, whatever you're doing with it. However, this car doesn't have that. And yeah, it's a little bit annoying, but again, it's <laughs> you just get used to it. And then I adjust the driver's side toggle and then the passenger side toggle. But Again, that's only if I'm in the car alone. If obviously I've got someone else in the car with me, then they'll adjust it to whatever they want. So yeah, it's not really a big deal, but uh, yeah, so far, so good. Now, obviously I've only had the car for a month, so I've not had to go for anything like tires or servicing or anything like that. So I can't comment on those costs just yet. However, I can tell you that we do have some pretty big tires on this car. They are 21 inch, where are they? 255, 35, 21s. I'm pretty sure it's a square size. Yeah, 255, 35, 21s. So you, you can already imagine that's gonna be, it's probably gonna be what, 250, 300 pound a corner, maybe, depending on what tires you get. So if you have to do an axle, probably five, 600 quid. Full, full car between a grand 1200 quid and again obviously it just depends what type of tires you go for you get the cheaper more budget ones but if you're driving something like this the tires and brakes are one thing you definitely do not want to skimp on as they are what keep you in contact with the road and make you stop so the last thing you want is to uh, press the brakes and nothing happens so with tires I will always spend a bit more get the better ones available. However, I am looking for another set of rims because I do like these, but obviously they're just the standard rims. I always like to sort of modify my stuff, go a little bit more aftermarket. And I need two sets of rims anyway for when, the, um, when winter comes along because we tend to go down skiing every year as a family, as a holiday, but we always drive down. So the standard wheels are going to become my winter wheels. So these will have winter tires on and get the chains for it. And so I'm going to need some summer tires with summer wheels. And they are turning out to be quite expensive as again, I'm looking for 21 inch wheels that will fit this car. I'm sort of going backwards and forward between 20 and 21 inch. Um, but I think like from factory, you could get them with a 19, 20 or 21 inch rim, dependent on uh, what packs you picked or obviously which wheel design you chose. But I quite like the way that it sits on 21s. Like it just looks good to me. And obviously the front, I could probably go down to a 20 inch and sort of like the brake will fill out the inner side a bit more, but I quite like having 
a little bit of breathing space there. So that's why I'm sort of leaning towards sticking with the 21 inch. So it does mean that the tires are gonna be a bit more compared to a 20 inch, but that's just the, the price of buying something like this. And obviously the other thing is servicing costs. I've not gotten around to needing a service yet. It's due one in around 7,000 miles or in October. So it's definitely gonna be the mileage one first. I believe I recall seeing something about it being 450, 500 pound from Audi, but obviously you can save some money going to a specialist. Fortunately, I'm lucky that a good friend of mine, Sam Harris, shout out to you. Um, he's a, he owns Sam Harris Automotive, which I've shouted out quite a few times. They do a lot of stuff for us and they are a VAG specialist in our area. So he's always like uh, serviced like the Golfs when we had them, my wife's up, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so you save a bit of money going to a specialist rather than Audi Direct because Audi is always gonna charge Audi prices, whereas a specialist is gonna be a bit cheaper, but you still get the same level of service, if not better, um, as they're small enough to care. So when the time comes around to that, uh, we will then, I'll be able to sort of give more of an idea on actual running costs throughout the year. So again, insurance, that's something that is completely sort of personal as it depends where you live, how many miles you do, um, just like, for example, where you live is, it affects it greatly because certain areas have more car thefts, others don't, others are safer. So all of those things just sort of come and contribute to it. So, in my case, I think it worked out to about 650 quid or 700 quid for the year, uh, but I'm piggybacking off of my house insurance. So again, that's, that's just all down to uh, personal situations. And so you, you just gotta go and compare the market and have a look. But other than that, I'd say so far it's been pretty good. So consumption wise, if I'm just doing like around the town, I'll get between two to 250 miles to the tank. And motorway, I'm getting almost 400 to the tank, if not a little bit more. So that's costing me about 85 pounds to fill up. I use Tesco Momentum because it's the best one in my area and it's 99. So why are these birds so loud? What, what is it with me in nature? Like it's always out to get me, but um, yeah, getting distracted as always. <laughs> So yeah, uh, it's about 85 pounds to fill it up from basically empty. And yeah, depending on the style of driving, I'd say it's pretty good considering like what you're getting from it. So I think we should go for a little drive and uh, yeah, see what it's like on the road again. Perfect, but 
However, I have noticed at times with the gearbox that it sometimes doesn't know what it wants to do, especially when it's in the auto mode. Um, so when, when you go from like slow speeds and you're like, oh, okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Sometimes it sits in the wrong gear and then it's like, after a couple of seconds, it's like, oh no, wait, I sh should be in a lower gear. Then all of a sudden kicks down and just boots off at which point you're sort of expecting it to already sort of pull away a little bit more gently. So that sometimes like, catches you off guard. And at times when you pull away from a junction, it doesn't know whether to be in first or second gear. Um, it'll pull away in second gear to start with, and then it's like, oh, you want a little bit more power. Then once it's really pulled away a little bit, it'll drop down to first and then just sort of like jolt you. Um, so a couple of those things aren't quite as smooth as I'd expect them to be. But again, once you get sort of used to it, it's not like the end of the world. Um, but it could definitely be improved and I assume that could probably be fixed with a gearbox tune. So if if it is to, to get sort of like a stage one map or something at some point, I'm not saying anything just yet, but um, I'd imagine there's like the, um, the Golf and the S3, like all the DSG boxes, you can get that mapped so it's it can handle the power. Um, by the power increase and they just sort of like smooth out the uh, sort of like the tune of how it engages the gears and, and all that good stuff so like with anything if there is issues that they can probably be fixed so I don't let it bother me too much but yeah it is a fantastic place to be and just again for me it's just ridiculous that something this size moves and handles the way it does and so I think Audi have done that perfectly to sort of like maintain the RS ethos uh, in, the, in um, the Q3 body because obviously the Q3 is just sort of like an SUV if you can even call it that um, but it's in no way shape or form made to go as quick as it does but yeah whatever they've trickery they've done they have nailed it uh, that's just uh but you get distracted at all times just putting your foot down when you're coming out of a corner and yeah all of a sudden just mind blank you're just focusing on the sound and how it pulls and just everything like that so yeah definitely definitely happy with my purchase no regrets like i said every every car is going to have its quirks or its little issues but as long as it's fundamentally a good car to drive and be in, doesn't cause really like any issues, then it's always going to be uh, a win in my book. So it's not like I bought the car and it spent more time back at the dealership sorting out problems than it has done uh, being in my ownership and being driven. And again, honestly, this car just pulling away from junctions is one of my favorite things and as you can see here go around the roundabout we're maintaining good speed and you've just got the grip obviously the traction lights flashing away but you know we are taking it at a decent speed and it's just sort of handling it as you want it to so if any of you are looking at buying an RSQ3, I'd say do it. It is fantastic. It's, it's definitely one of my favorite cars I've ever owned so far. Don't you beep at me, Mr. GoPro. Um, okay, apparently it's just trying to prove a point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's by far one of the best cars. The only car that tops it is the S15, and I'm sorry, but that car was just special to me and I don't think anything's going to be beating it anytime soon. It will forever be the one that got away and uh, I'm hoping that one day I can get back into the seat of one or if not the one. So I know the guy that currently owns it and he has said if it ever does go up for sale he's going to let me know first. So fingers crossed if that 
ever comes to it that I can pull the money out from somewhere and get it because that car was amazing. But that's not the point of this video. This video is what the car's like and yeah, it is great. So if there's anything you guys want to see specifically with uh, with this car, like content wise, if you want to know anything about it in particular, do let me know down in the comments and I will try my best to uh, get all the information you guys need. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It was meant to be short. I've got a feeling it's probably become a little bit more long-winded than anticipated just because I will just go off on a tangent all of a sudden and just start chatting like I'm doing now. But next video, MX-5. Uh, so we've got some bits to fit to it. And the brakes are very nearly almost done. So that won't be the next video, it'll be the week after. Uh, the brakes finally, finally being fitted. Um, so yeah, I've got all the calipers. They, they've dropped them off to Sam. He's painted them all for me. It just needs the, the last bits doing to them, the final touches. And then, yes, we can finally fit them to the car. And it can be usable. So next week, MX-5 stuff. Uh, we've got some bits and pieces to fit probably going to try and roll the arches if we can just so we can get um, some more clearance for the wheels because at the moment anytime I go over a bump they just rub but yeah I hope you guys have enjoyed sorry for dragging it on but I will catch you guys in the next video cheers <laughs>